Thank you, Kamal Hassan. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, and welcome, everyone, uh, those from outside especially. It's a cold, long journey to come here. I know because I had to come from outside <laughs> back in again. Um, and I want to preface this by saying I did a similar lecture in Utrecht, which was a disaster. You know, uh, my son said, it was awful. Uh, uh, and uh, I accepted that criticism because I tried to cover too many things in a very limited period of time. I nearly fell asleep. The audience nearly fell asleep, you know, but fortunately we were looking forward to beers at the end of it, so everyone was awake. So what I'm going to do is a more limited thing this time. Uh, I just want to say that the topic to me is absolutely vital. Uh, if I was rector of ISS, if you're fortunate I'm not rector of ISS, I would make this topic absolutely mandatory because I believe the way things are going in terms of the international trading system is going to fundamentally change all of our lives. And you will see really in the not too distant future once these trade agreements are concluded. And I think the backdrop to this is the important announcement by Donald Trump saying that he's not going to sign TPP. Uh, and then there's a pause because actually we don't believe that. We believe eventually he will sign TPP, but in a different form. Uh, the reason why he makes all these comments is because already the changes in the global system, and I'm not going to call it the trading system, have had far-reaching repercussions for people in the advanced countries. Something they never imagined would happen, which is that for a large number of them, their living standards have started to be seriously affected, and are likely to be even more affected in the future. <coughs> so I think Trump has worked out that this is one of the sources of those problems and he wants a renegotiation because at stake are some very fundamental aspects of the global economy and those are the things I'm going to try and bring out. Uh, on the other side, I know many of you were disappointed that Hillary Clinton didn't win. I not because Hillary Clinton wanted to sign all the agreements with no conditions, okay? So I think that would have been even more disastrous in lots of ways, so this is a very provocative thing for me to say, but I will make clear exactly, because in my view, Hillary Clinton has, is the end product of 15 years of billions of dollars of spending by the corporations. Billions of dollars. I think every politician they could have bought, they have bought. And then along comes Donald Trump and spoils the party. Uh, and I think these agreements are so important because, and that's the thing I want to show you, is they undermine the democratic system. The fundamental to undermining democracy and capitalism cannot actually work with democracy. It's not possible any longer. They, many people don't realize that already one leg of that has gone. The central banks of the world, the most powerful institutions, are already outside the democratic control. And now they want the second part to be also outside the democratic control. That's the reason for TTIP, TPP, and the Doha round. Because once those are signed, it makes no difference who you elect. You will not have any control over your lives in future. Okay? And this might seem apocalyptic, but I can show it to you. We already have enough and more evidence to prove it. And I think this evidence, the powers that be did not want to get out 
until it's too late. And I think to a certain extent it is already too late. And we saw it with CETA, with the approval of CETA. In spite of one group in the EU, the Walloons in Belgium, opposing it, the EU commissioners were so confident and so arrogant, they said, don't worry, it's going to be done next 48 hours. And it was done next 48 hours. Because the power that is behind these international agreements is so massive that it's unstoppable force. You know, there's so much money because what is at stake? What is at stake is not billions, but trillions of dollars of profits because there can be no regulatory apparatus to stop the corporations once these agreements are signed. And it's important to see what exactly some of these agreements are. Okay? Now, I always get accused by people of uh, scaring everyone to such an extent they can't sleep at night. Don't be scared, just know what the enemy is and, you know, that it's time to wake up and do something about it. That's really what this is about. Okay, so this is what I'm proposing to do is, and um, I uh, want to make some general points, not get too bogged down in technical details. I want actually some important points to come across. And if we want to create a discussion of some technical details, we'll get into it. And there are a few people in the audience here who are actually more knowledgeable of those technical details than I am. So I will uh, ask these people who are in the audience here to please contribute as well to those aspects of the discussion. I mean, the general aspects of the discussion as well. <coughs> Starting point <coughs> is this, that it's very important to actually understand what the international trading system is. The starting point is, it's not actually an international trading system we're talking about any longer. Historically, when I say trade, you have the impression in your head, someone produces a good in one country, puts it on a ship or a plane, and it goes to another country, isn't it? I mean, that's our impression of trade. But that is actually a very small part of what all these new agreements are about. What these new agreements are about is actually the global production system, not the trading system. Although all of the things I'm going to discuss are formally put under the trading system, it's no longer true. In fact, it changed about 25 years ago. And the start of the change was when they introduced trade in services, trade in services, okay? So trade in goods we understand, produce the good in one country, export it to another, okay, it goes across the border. But a service doesn't do this. I mean, it doesn't happen when we produce a service. A service is produced at the point of consumption. So for example, banking services. We don't produce banking services in Holland, ship them over to China, and the Chinese consume them. No. The Dutch bank is in China and provides the service directly. So what happened is, in a whole series of disputes, once it was accepted that services should also be governed by international trade rules, it was established that what we should concern ourselves with is how a good is produced. Not how it's moved between countries, but how is it produced. And once we accepted that, we opened a can of worms, in the sense that we could then introduce all other manner of conditions governing production which should be regulated under these agreements. And that's what you're going to see. For example, we now talk of intellectual property. Okay? And that's under trade. Investment codes. That's also under trade. Okay? So we've now mutated this to such an extent 
that it's absurd to talk about the international trading system when in fact we're talking about the international production system. Okay? And that really happened during the 1980s and that's why it's very important to understand that's what we're really talking about. And when we talk about the system, what we're really talking about is the set of structures that governs this global production system. Okay? And that's what we're interested in. What are those structures? What's their purpose? When did this system that we talk about begin? Well, formally it began with uh, industrial development of Britain and colonization. In more modern times, it begins with the post-Second World War period when the US and Europe wanted to establish their control over the world economy. Okay? And then we see this system that we recognize today emerging then. This system has never been free or fair. It's the job of academics to pretend it's free and fair. Okay, so the academics are basically the ideologues. We have to pretend to everybody and try and convince everyone this is a free and fair system. If everyone participates, we'll all be better off. Okay, so that's the job of the academics. And when, we, when academics actually write, they say it serves the interests of everyone. It benefits everyone. World welfare is improved. Of course, this is not true. It's not to say that we are not better off because of some of the international trade agreements. I'm not saying that. But the system is there to serve the rich and the powerful. Okay, that's what it's about. It's basically not even countries in the final instance. It's the corporations. Okay, it just so happens that initially most of the rich and powerful corporations are located in the United States, Europe. But this is also changing now. You know, in the not too distant future, the country calling the shots will be China. Okay, its corporations are starting to dominate the globe. And for any of you under any illusion thinking, oh, China will be much better than the Americans were, forget it. You know, it's always the same. It, what matters is money, you know, not the human beings. So China will do the same that all countries have done in the past. They will make use of the system and the international institutions that control the system. So the international institution that we're particularly concerned with in this lecture is the WTO. But there are also other international institutions that are important, which we won't deal with in this, in this lecture, and that's the IMF and the World Bank. Okay? But in this lecture, it's the WTO that we're going to look at. Now what I want to do is just very briefly go through 400 years of history, just like this, you know. Uh, and why this is important to me is because when we talk about free trade today and countries having the right to choose, we forget that the countries, most of the countries we're talking about were colonized. We forget that those countries were actually, had their developments completely distorted and perverted. Essentially, these countries had their entire economies remodeled to serve the interests of the advanced countries. Essentially, these were raw material producers and primary goods suppliers. It's very important because when we teach doctrines of trade, we say these countries are free to produce whatever they want to produce. Of course, this is not true. This is just simply a myth. They're not free to produce whatever they want to produce according to their advantage. They were forced into the production of certain commodities. And the aim of the system is to keep them producing precisely those commodities for the interest of the advanced countries. Okay? 
So Sri Lanka was not naturally a tea producer. India was not naturally a tea producer. Okay? Not any more than China was naturally a rice producer. In fact, in the 1950s, advisors to the new Chinese communist government even told China that your natural advantage is producing rice. Okay? In other words, they wanted China to fit into that same mold. Produce what you're good at producing, but of course the reason why these countries were told to do this is because it served the advanced countries' interests. And that's what colonization did. It actually destroyed the self-sufficient base of these countries, forced them into the production of one or two goods. And the most important thing it deprived them of was their own food production. Okay, because once I destroy the food production of a country, they're my prisoner. In the 1850s, the only reason I mention Britain's dominance is because when Britain assumed dominance of the world system for the advanced countries, it started to espouse the virtues of free trade. This was totally hypocritical in the same way the US espouses free trade today, but has absolutely no intention of liberalizing its trade. Okay, so Britain went around preaching free trade but practicing restricted trade. Okay? That's the game the advanced countries play. And that's what's very important even when we look at the systems today. People talk with one tongue, but actually the meaning is something totally different. Just an example of Britain preached free trade at the time of its industrialization, and its industrialization was based on garments and textiles. But there was one country that actually was superior to Britain in the production of garments. It galls me to say this, but it's India. I wanted to say Sri Lanka, but you know, I can't. Okay, it was India. India was far in advance of Britain in the production of garments, and actually one part of India in particular, Bihar. Bihar, in my, when I was growing up, was synonymous with starvation and poverty. But Bihar was one of the richest parts of the entire planet at the time that Britain had colonized India. Now, Bihar was so productive, it was exporting garments to Britain and destroying British manufacturing industry in Manchester, Leeds, and all the main centers. So these garments producers demanded the British authorities impose tariffs. This is a country that's preaching free trade, now imposes tariffs. Indians were so productive that even when the tariff went as high as 75% on the value of the import, 75% tax, Indians were still beating the British. That's how competitive they were. So, what does a good colonial power do? They simply ban all garments production in India. You know, they force the closure of all the factories in India. And that's why Essentially, Bihar went into decline, and we have the end result being poverty. This is one of the poorest parts of India. Okay, now it's the hypocrisy I wanted to get to because it's the same hypocrisy of the US. US preaches free trade, but the very first thing the US does in a new system and we will come to that, the very first thing the US does is it says, okay, we will have free trade in everything as long as it's in things we want. But if it's in anything that the developing countries want, we're blocking it. So what developing countries wanted was free trade in agricultural goods, where developing countries had an advantage. But the Americans said no free trade in agricultural goods. So basically, in one sweep, they knocked out most of the exports of the developing countries. The second thing that 
developing countries wanted was free trade in garments. The US took that as well out of any discussions of free trade. You see, so it's again this endless hypocrisy. We preach one thing, our academics teach that in the universities, but there's absolutely no intention of practicing it. Okay? It's just a game we're playing. If we can convince you to actually abide by the free trade, then we win. Because we're not practicing it. And we will come to this again and again as we go along. Part of the present system after decolonization, remember now we can't tell India what to produce, but now we have to create the structures to get the countries that we want to produce these raw materials to do our bidding. And those structures involve debt. Okay? We in debt these developing countries. If you don't do what we say, we call in the debts, and then you're in trouble. Okay? And that, that's where the institutions of the IMF and the World Bank come in and play an important role. Apart from this economic control through debt, we also impose political controls. And, yes, I'm going to say bribery and corruption. Okay, bribery and corruption has been incredibly important for the West. To actually bribe the politicians that they want to bribe to do the things that the Western countries want them to do. But, of course, now in the academic literature, the way we see it is developing country bureaucrats are somehow genetically inclined towards bribery and corruption, you know? As long as you have a black skin or brown skin or even a yellow skin, you are suspiciously inclined towards bribery and corruption, okay? I mean, that's basically the way we have the literature. I'm being very crude about it, but these are many of the studies on corruption. In fact, we don't see that the whole system of corruption is part of that control mechanism that we have imposed. The last part of that control, which I've mentioned, is ideology. So people come to ISS, we teach them, you should produce these goods, this is the way you should run your economy, they go back to their countries, they do exactly what we have told them. We hope not, but anyway, <laughs> that's the role of ideology. Okay, so that theory that we have been uh, imparting to everyone from developing countries is basically, well, it's 400 years old now. And it's quite an ancient theory where we tell them, look, if you produce what you're good at producing, and we produce what we're good at producing, and we exchange these goods, everyone will be happier. Okay? All world welfare will be improved. Okay, so this was the core, and we have now modified that to take into account, remember we're now having trade in services, intellectual property being liberalized, investment flows. Okay, so the academics have also come up with justifications for these. Okay, so one of the justifications, if you don't violate intellectual property, if you respect Western countries, property rights, in other words, their patents. So you don't go around copying Microsoft software and using it. Then Microsoft will be very happy to share its intellectual property with you. Okay, so that's a theory that we've been trying to put across to people from the developing world. Don't steal our technology. We will share it with you. The thing that they forget is that all countries have stolen from other countries. That's actually how they have developed, by stealing other people's technology. The US stole British steam technology. It didn't pay for it. It stole it. Today, this process continues to this very day. CIA's budget is in part spying on foreign companies, giving that technology to American companies. Chinese must be doing the same thing. 
Okay? So academics, what they do is they try and legitimize all these liberalizations with all these theories without realizing that actually in the real world this is simply a myth. You know? This is not what happens in the real world. Okay, I'm coming to the most recent times, and that is after the Second World War, with U.S. the real victor in the Second World War, it was up to the U.S. to re-establish control of the global system. And the, it went about that by creating three important institutions, the World Bank, IMF, and the WTO. In fact, the WTO wasn't called the WTO, it was called the International Trade Organization. And the problem with the International Trade Organization is the Americans hand over responsibility to Canadians. You never give Canadians responsibility for doing anything. <laughs> because they start being too democratic about it, isn't it? Canadians will go and say, now what's your opinion? Yes, that's a good idea, we'll put that in. <laughs> so these Canadians went around asking people from the developing world, what do you want to see in this document? What do you want to see in the International Trade Organization? The end result was what we call the Havana Charter. The Americans hadn't been blunt and explicit to the Canadians. This is not asking people for their opinion, this is telling them this is the way it's going to be. We're going to set up an institution that's going to perpetuate your exploitation, and that's the end of the story. No, they asked everyone's opinion and wrote it down in the Havana Charter. It's a great charter to read, because there, stated in black and white, is a recipe for how global development could take place on a relatively equal basis. Okay, so we were very concerned about employment, we were very concerned about poverty, we were very concerned about making sure labor rights were safeguarded. All these things were in the Havana Charter. What do you think happened when the Charter was put before the American Congress? It was thrown out. Immediately thrown out. This was not the game plan. You see? So instead what happened is they set up what is called the GATT. The General Agreement, Trade and Tariffs. And this is not an institution, but actually a set of agreements. And there was a GATT Secretariat form to record all the agreements and support the drafting of the agreements, but it wasn't an institution, not like the WTO, the IMF, or the World Bank. Because they could not accept the International Trade Organization as it was depicted in the Havana Charter, because they couldn't accept the Havana Charter, you see. So that's why we had the birth of the GATT. And there are just two, well, three things I want to note. The history of all the trade rounds going right up to the Uruguay round. The first principle established by the Americans was we should not have serious imposition of trade, requ trade liberalization requirements on Europe because Europe must have time to rebuild. Now this is very important because we don't say that to the developing countries. We do not give them a grace period. You can put all these tariffs in order to develop your industry. We don't say that. Okay? Because the developing countries have a different role to play. They're the ones who are providing the cheap raw materials, you see. We're not going to encourage them to industrialize. Europe, we encourage to industrialize. Number two, I told you that the Americans said, in all the discussions, you are not allowed to discuss liberalization of agriculture and garments and textiles. The two most important things to the developing countries, okay? So there's a taken out, which is, again, an illustration of the hypocrisy of this idea that free trade is beneficial to everyone. And the third thing, which is always quickly 
brushed over is what is called non-tariff barriers. What the advanced countries decided to do is to impose <coughs> all manner of barriers to prevent developing countries producing and exporting goods that the advanced countries did not want them to produce and export. The most important of those were manufacturers. So what the advanced countries did is establish what is called ISO standards. These are, in effect, non-tariff barriers. Then they imposed health and safety standards. Okay, so suddenly they would discover you have used a toxic paint on this manufactured item. In other words, there were hundreds of different ways in which they blocked the imports that they didn't want. We call those non-tariff barriers, but again, in the literature, no one discusses it. And even though developing countries time and time again wanted these issues discussed, the advanced countries refused point blank. And then we come to the Uruguay round. So this is the substantive part of uh, what I have to say because there everything changed. The definition of trade changes because now we're going to talk about trade in services. Now we're going to talk about intellectual property. Now we're going to talk about investment codes. Okay, so this is no longer the old type of discussion of trade. And <clears throat> after the Uruguay round, the very last round we're in is called the Doha round. And that I will also give a little bit of time to. I'm just going to take up some of the Uruguay round issues because those are what are reappearing in TTIP. And the Doha round new issues are also in TTIP. Okay, so it's really these new issues in the Doha round which the corporations have been after for a very long time, which they now want to put, well, basically put to rest. In other words, we want it over and done with. And once that is over and done with, actually, there will not be another global trade round. Okay, this is the very last global trade round, because after this, everything has been achieved. And the corporations know it's too expensive because I told you they have spent billions and billions of dollars. They're not going to spend this again. Okay? This is the last time and this is actually not much more is needed after this. So I'm just going to look at a couple of things. One thing of note is in every trade round discussion, the question should always be asked, but is not asked in the literature, who sets the agenda? And who appoints the chairperson? Because these are two very important aspects of every trade round. Well, the agenda is always set by the advanced countries, always. Developing countries have no say whatsoever. Who appoints the chairperson? Normally, it's the United States. Okay? They are the ones who ultimately appoint the chairperson of every round. Okay, so. In the Doha round, the chairperson, the initial chairperson, was the foreign minister, foreign trade, uh, the trade minister of Kuwait. Okay, one of the U.S.'s client states, in other words. And basically, the entire agenda was set by the advanced countries. Has always been. Has always been. The developing countries don't have a say. The problem now is countries like China, Brazil, India, they're pretty angry about this because they feel they're powerful and they want to say it. So this is creating a number of problems. And these are the important bits and pieces in the Uruguay round. A few of these we need to pay some attention to. We can't go through the technical details, but just so that you understand what some of the important issues are. The first one is the agreement on agriculture. This is especially important to developing countries. You see, cut a long story short, what the advanced countries said was, look, if you don't have subsidies on, in agriculture, 
if you do not have certain tariffs to protect your agriculture, if you do not give support to your farmers, you can't do it from now on. So once the document was signed, they said all those who had support for their farmers, all those who gave subsidies, could keep them. But anyone who, after the agreement, wanted to give new subsidies could not do that. Now here's the beauty of this. You see, this is in 1986, but for 20 years before that, the World Bank had been involved in lending money to all developing countries around the world. What do you think one of the most important conditions was? You have to eliminate support to agriculture. You see, so country after country, they forced to eliminate all subsidies to agriculture, all protection of agriculture. Now comes the agreement on agriculture. It says if you don't have support, you can't impose it. Anyone know what the biggest component of the European budget is? Support to agriculture, of course. You know roughly a ballpark figure how much that is. Well, it's $300 million. Okay? That's roughly what it is. US, how much do they give to their agriculture? Roughly the same order. Income support. There are two things that you should notice here. Remember, these are countries that preach free trade. In other words, we don't support any of our industries. Why are they bothering to give so much money to agriculture? Why? And why is it they go around telling developing countries, don't support your agriculture, it's very bad. It's very bad. And that's what the World Bank did for a long, long time, so much so that support in many countries is virtually nothing. A country like Peru. Peru was self-sufficient in maize production. And one reason is the Peruvian government subsidized maize to up to 30% of the value of maize. But over time, the World Bank forced Peru to eliminate all that subsidy. And that's why many farmers turned to coca production in Peru. But Peru now imports maize from the U.S. where the subsidy amounts to 70% of the value of maize. So the U.S. is giving 70% of the value of maize as a subsidy to its farmers but Peru was not allowed to give any subsidy to its farmers. Why do you think? Well, in 1970s, the US Congress passed legislation to say that they will not support the World Bank if the World Bank continued to encourage food self-sufficiency in Latin America. Because if you want to have control over a country, one of the things you should control is its food supply. If they're not producing their own food, how long can they bargain with you? How long can they argue with you? They need to import the food. Okay? It was a strategy, a deliberate strategy. The agreement on agriculture cemented that. Developing countries were more or less bullied into signing this. But it comes back to haunt the advanced countries because developing countries realized they were taken for a ride. This is the second important thing that was concluded in the Uruguay round. It's called the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. This is the one that everyone who knows about TTIP gets particularly worked up about because it's now being brought here. And what this implies, what GATS implies under TTIP, is that all the things you hold dear and sacred to you in Europe is likely to disappear in terms of education, cheap education, cheap health care, etc., etc. In other words, services. Because one of the things GATS does is it tries to privatize all services. 
Why this is important is because services are the last great frontier for capitalism. So everyone needs education. Everyone. You know? It's a captive group, isn't it? Everyone desperately wants education. And until the last 20 years, most of it was provided by government. So there was a systematic onslaught on this. The vehicle was gas. I mean, this is just one area. The other areas are financial services, healthcare. Okay, many of these, the aim of the game is to privatize. And there, in the original regulations, what it says is that they got everyone to sign because they said, don't worry, we're not going to privatize anything you don't want us to privatize. Okay? And when someone tells you, don't worry, just sign on the dotted line, you should get worried. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was, that basically the countries who signed were allowed to exempt large areas of services. So if they said, no, we don't want to privatize education, fine. Okay, but in this agreement, there was an interesting clause saying that the GATS applies, so liberalization applies to everything which is not constituted as a government-run service. So it applies to something which is in effect what is called a privately delivered service. Now the whole thing at the beginning was what is the definition of a government service and what is a private service. Because if it is a private service, the government cannot subsidize it, cannot give money to it without giving everyone else money. All other services would have to be given the same amount of money if they were giving a service which was deemed to be commercial private. So what was the criteria? In the early days, it was a percentage of revenue. The very first percentage I read was anything that was more than two and a half percent from private sources, so more than two and a half percent of the total revenue of the activity was from private sources, was called private. Okay? Which, of course, meant that virtually everything was, in effect, private. And what you got is many countries, very quietly, in education, they started to charge students in one directly or indirectly for bits of education. You know, in Holland, you've got the school books, you know, where parents have to cough up money for school books. But more obviously, it's school fees, it's university fees. Okay, these gradually have risen. In some countries, risen much more rapidly. The idea is that you are now priming higher education for full privatization. This is what it's really about. So in Holland, you will see that somewhere in the future, the Dutch education will see fees of between 15 and 20,000 euros. You're lucky at the moment because I think the highest fees being paid are, what, 1,500, 1,750? a year, but in the not too distant future, these have to rise. You already see it in Britain, and if TTIP is signed, it's for absolute sure that that's what's likely to happen. It actually comes from this GATS agreement. This one we will discuss further when we discuss TTIP, but basically this is about food safety. So in Europe, people are worried about food safety, about GMO, genetically modified crops, and adulterated food, so you know, spraying meat with lactic acid and things like that. Okay, so in Europe, this is not allowed, but in US, it's allowed. And the Americans introduced this into the Uruguay <coughs> round because they did not want 
any country banning their food exports because they use genetically modified seed or because they adulterated the meat in some way or another with growth hormones or whatever. Okay? And this was a big battle. The Americans won the battle formally, but the Europeans went ahead and still banned meat imports from the U.S. if it had, was impregnated with hormones and so on. And the Americans have been fighting this battle and suing the Europeans, and in the end the Americans are winning this battle. And once TTIP is signed, this particular battle is going to be over, because the Americans will win that one. There's one more uh, important one, and that is called trade-related intellectual property rights. And here, basically, everything that can be patented is patented. But there's one very interesting development with this, is that because patenting things mostly requires some modification of a natural process, this is what has been stimulated considerably after the TRIPS agreement was signed. So every country now has to have laws to protect intellectual property. So if I have a copyright, I'm protected for 20 years. You can't copy my work. If I have a patent, I'm protected for a very long period of time. You can't use my patent without paying me money. The trick is to make sure that I have a product which I have produced, where I can differentiate it from a natural product, something that naturally occurs in nature. And this is where you find all the genetic modifications. I came across such a modification in Sri Lanka, where Dutch farmers were selling potato seed, not selling, giving it away, to the farmers in Sri Lanka. And the farmers in Sri Lanka, being poor, were very grateful to the Dutch, saying, how very kind of you, you know, not realizing that this potato seed was a very special potato seed. It was genetically modified to be sterile. So in other words, once the potato plant grew, you couldn't actually take a seed and plant that seed again because the seeds were all sterile. Okay, so that's a modification that has taken place so that, so now who are the farmers going to go to because they can't take the seed from their own potatoes anymore because they're all sterile, they have to go back to the company. Okay, so we see this is a very important practice for many companies that genetic modification is actually encouraged by these trade related intellectual property rights. What is really strange about this is the hypocrisy of it. Originally, a group was formed in the US to actually try and get intellectual property protected. That group said, okay, we must use WIPO, which is a UN organization, World Inter Intellectual Property Organization. But the problem of WIPO is the advanced countries couldn't control it. So they got a brilliant idea. Why don't we put the word trade in front of intellectual property rights? So they called it trade-related intellectual property rights. It has nothing to do with trade at all. It does not belong in the WTO. Believe it or not, many orthodox economists also think this is absurd and ridiculous and should be taken out of the WTO. A very famous trade economist called Bhagwati has written over and over again, are we stupid or what? Because, you know, just somebody decided to add the term trade related to intellectual property rights and bingo, now we have it in the WTO. Of course, the point is that this is a forum in which we can do anything we want to do. And that was the reason for it. The last thing is on the WTO. So the WTO was set up at the Uruguay round. And the head of the WTO is normally appointed by uh, essentially uh, nominations from the advanced countries. And it has only one function. 
to promote liberalization. That's all. So it has no obligation to talk to anyone about the environment, about development, about labor standards, nothing. Okay? It only has one function, and that is to promote liberalization. Interesting thing about the WTO and the head of the WTO is that not only the head of the WTO, but all previous heads of the GATT, the GATT Secretariat, have always had intimate relationships with American and European business councils. They only talk to business leaders. They never talk to NGOs. They never entertain any discussion from NGOs. And when they leave their post, in nearly all cases, and in fact, I don't know of one case where a head of either the WTO or the GAP didn't go into one business think tank or another. So these organizations are intimately connected with business, and therefore you know what fundamentally the policies are designed to do. Okay, so we came to the Doha round. This is where things went badly wrong for the advanced countries because they thought, okay, we got all these great things in the Uruguay round. Why don't we push it further? Why don't we now go for broke? We introduce everything that we have ever wanted. And so they said, we're going to now push ahead with more services liberalization. We're going to go ahead with more intellectual property rights regulations and we're now going to introduce a special dispute settlement procedure. They also wanted to continue with further trade liberalization, so manufacturers, but they got into trouble because the developing countries were really angry about the agreement on agriculture. By now, the developing countries realize that they have been taken for a ride. And they said, unless we get some movement on agreement on agriculture where you allow us to subsidize our agriculture or you eliminate all your subsidies, we're not going to negotiate. And that's what led to the breakdown of the Doha round. Because the advanced countries had so much invested in their agriculture and promoting their agricultural sectors and blocking developing countries that it was very difficult for them to make compromises. But the advanced countries decided that that was not going to stop them. And these very important bits of the new agreements they were going to continue with. And the way they did it was they set up free trade agreements with numbers of countries. So initially the idea was the US had to set up free trade agreements with Latin American countries. Europe had to do it with African and Pacific countries. Okay, we call them EPAs, Economic Partnership Agreements, where essentially all the things they wanted in this round were put into all these agreements. And the important things they wanted, the new agreements were many, but the really important ones were just three. Investment, government procurement, and a new dispute settlement procedure. The investment agreement was this. You see, up to now, developing countries that were successful East Asian countries had used foreign investment in their country as a platform to build their own economies. The way they did that is they forced foreign companies to employ local people at high <coughs> levels and train them. Okay? We call that transfer of skills. They forced foreign companies to also transfer technology gradually to local companies. They forced foreign companies to use local material and local resources. And the last thing they forced foreign companies to do is to export. Because East Asian countries 
set up a whole mechanism to grow their economies by exporting. So they wanted foreign companies to join that process. So they used foreign <coughs> multinationals to help them grow. So Japan was the first to do this, followed by Korea, then we have Singapore, then we have Malaysia, Taiwan, etc. So the model was very clear. The multinationals didn't like it because their hands were tied, but they had to go to these countries because these were successful countries, and they came up with investment codes. They tried to get it in the Uruguay round, but it was opposed, and now they bring it back again in Doha. This was opposed in Doha, now they bring it in TTIP and TPP. These are these two big agreements that are currently being discussed. So, these are the agreements that essentially these Western countries and the multinationals are using to push through all the things that they wanted. And this is the one we focus, and this is the last I spend about five or ten minutes on TTIP. It's basically an agreement between the US and Europe. But what is interesting about this agreement is it's being labeled as the framework document for all future <coughs> trade agreements. So once this is agreed, all future agreements will have to be based on this one document. And that's the idea of it. And there are many important bits in it, but it's actually the same bits we've already been discussing. Uh, I just raise a few of them. This is the one that still people in advanced countries are doubting. They cannot believe that their world is going to change so fundamentally that this services agreement, we call it TISA. Trade in Services Agreement, TISA, that this is actually going to be signed as part of TTIP. Well, here's news for you, it is going to be signed, because this is the absolute core of the whole agreement. And what this says is that all services, with the exception of very limited ones, where, and the wording is, those supplied in the exercise of government authority, the red there. Those are the only things that are exempt. So that's judiciary and border police and one other. I forget what the other one is. Okay, and they're the only ones that are exempt because all the others, all other services, are basically services which are carried out on a commercial basis, as we discussed, or are in competition with services provided by private entities. So, for example, education. We're part of Rotterdam University here, but there are other universities in the Netherlands that are purely private. After TTIP, if the Dutch government gives Rotterdam University a grant based on the numbers of students, and there is a private university somewhere else in the Netherlands, they can claim exactly the same amount of money in ratio of the students that they have. Worse still, I am from Sri Lanka, supposing I set up a branch of the University of Colombo here in Holland. I manage to attract 5,000 students, I also get the same amount of money in relation to the numbers of students. You understand very quickly the Dutch government cannot do this. So it has only one choice, is it says, okay, you're all on your own. We're going to privatize all higher education. Up to now, I was under the belief, and I must say many others were, that the Europeans had managed somehow to get an agreement to limit the privatization just to higher education. I was just reading a study done by John Hillary, who is the head of War on Want in the UK, a British charity, and a very knowledgeable person. 
who says that this is actually a pipe dream. Once TISA is signed, all education will be privatized because actually any educational company that takes the Dutch government to court will win. Since the regulation is very clear, governments can demand all the exemptions they want and formally everyone can say, yes, yes, we grant you that exemption. But in a court of law, they will lose the battle. And that means to say that all, all education is essentially going to be privatized over a certain period of time. This is also true of health care. Why do you think Theresa May actually has gone back on her promise to inject 300 million pounds into the National Health Service? Why? Because she knows once they conclude their trade deal with the United States, the very first thing the Americans have asked for is the privatization of the British National Health Service. That's the very first thing that they have asked for. And it's the thing that the British government has already conceded. Many people know this. And that is because under this agreement, under the services agreement, you cannot stop the privatization. People in Holland are worried about the water privatization because water management in Holland has been so fundamental to preventing flooding. And they think there's no way the Dutch government is going to allow that to be privatized. Think again. That also competes with a number of companies that actually do the same thing that the Dutch Water Authority does, managing basically water levels and so on. So, in principle, there's actually nothing that is not going to be privatized. One of the things, one of the end consequences of this is the living standards of people will definitely decline. There's no doubt. You have children. You will have to do what the Americans do, is from the day that the child is born, you have to start putting money aside for their education, because you're going to have to pay for every part of their education. And you're going to talk of at least 50 to 100,000 Dutch guilders. You know, that's a big, big sum of money. You know, Europeans are not used to this type of thing. Okay. A second one, which is considered to be particularly destructive is one of the agreements of in TTIP is what is called regulatory harmonization. This is like food safety, okay, but it's also hazardous materials. Now in the US, essentially the standards, the US food safety standards are very, very low. They not only tolerate GMO, so for example, in the average American supermarket, 70% of all processed food in the US supermarket is, contains genetically modified materials, 70%. In Europe, it's, it's under 5%. And that amount also has to be labeled. If you have genetically modified seed or any material in a foodstuff, you have to label it. After TTIP, that's gone. Not only will you have to allow American imports into your supermarkets, but you can no longer put these labels there. Then, you know, Americans are uh, famous for essentially uh, treating chicken and turkey with chlorine. You know, it's high pressure, chlorine impregnates the meat, and basically it preserves the meat. But this is carcinogenic. In other words, cancer inducing. The Americans reject this. The arguments that they use violates what is called the precautionary principle. In Europe, you have to prove that what you're doing is safe. In the US, it's the opposite. Someone has to prove that, for example, GMO is damaging to the health. 
But as everyone knows, GMO's damage to the health is only known after a generation. Okay, so in the meantime, everyone is basically a guinea pig. And it's the same with most other food products. In the US, you have to prove that that product is damaging to health. You know, it's not the other way around. So in Europe, the precautionary principle is the norm, but once we have this harmonization of regulatory framework, that's also gone. Labor laws, unknown to many people, the US has not signed core labor laws with the ILO. So labor standards set by ILO are not agreed to by the US formally. And this means to say that in a number of states in the US, companies can arbitrarily cut wages. They can also impose different working hours without any negotiation, any discussion, any appeal to any standards whatsoever. They can also cut pensions, contributions to health care, if they say that they're financially in trouble. In other words, there is no separation of the money for workers, so for their pensions, health care, etc., and the company's own money. Okay? It's actually mixed. So if the company goes down, you basically lose your pensions. Up to now, this is absolutely sacred in Europe. Uh, who saw Michael Moore's film on situation in Europe? You remember he did uh, a couple of films, Who Are We Going to Invade Next? Do you remember he did this film? And there he showed Italian workers. Do you remember? And they, they thought life was so great in the US, and he said, how many uh, weeks do you get holiday? Well, they were thinking, well, we get seven weeks basic, and now we get also two weeks there on top, and if uh, we're going to have a child, then we get six months off, and so on. And then he says to them, you know how much you get in the US? Two weeks. And these people were absolutely shocked, because you know their idea is in the US, it's all paradise, you see, so we want to all go to the US and enjoy this paradise. Two weeks, they said? <laughs> Two weeks? And then they started laughing at Michael Moore because they couldn't believe it. They thought he was joking. But of course, he's deadly serious. And the important thing is, these are the labor laws that will be imposed on Europe. And it's not bad Americans imposing it on the nice Europeans. The European corporations want it because the European corporations actually believe labor has too good a life in Europe and they must knuckle down and now work much harder and you know have less protection and so on and so forth. Uh, we just mentioned environment in, in passing. Can I just uh, finish that? Uh, mention environment in passing? Come back to me. And there one important thing that the Europeans are now after is oil and gas from the US. Okay, so this is the big deal. They want to move away from Russia, move towards the US. One of the implications of that directly is that, uh, well, the tar sands in Canada will be even more uh, utilized and also the fracking in the US will actually be ratcheted up one notch. Not that Donald Trump cares very much, I mean he wants to go back to coal as well. So in terms of environmental destruction I think this is definitely going to go up a notch. In fact, very conservative estimates have said that once TTIP is signed, Europe will be responsible for an increase in emissions of 11 million cubic meters of CO2. And that is likely to put them above the Kyoto threshold level which they have actually agreed to. So this is actually an EU study, a commission study itself, coming with this conclusion. On the regulatory side, again, in the US, Basically, the onus of proof with regard to toxic materials is on the prosecutor. So if 
companies use various chemicals, you have to prove that those chemicals are damaging to human health or damaging to the environment in some way. That's actually very difficult to do. Hence, it's very difficult to ban those substances. And then I end with this. It's just to show you, so uh, for years I've been using other examples. I've now come across new examples, and this is with regard to this very sinister investor uh, disputes settlement mechanism. So it's investor to stay litigation. Up to now, it's not possible for companies to sue governments. But after TTIP, and basically NAFTA introduced this, it's now possible for companies to sue governments. And this is where the real undermining of democracy comes in. Many examples, one good example is Slovakia and Acmea, the Dutch insurer. So Slovakia in 2006 voted in a democratic government which represented the disenchantment of voters with a previous government that privatized health care. It privatized health care and made it very expensive for ordinary people, excluding large numbers of Slovakians from health care systems. So they voted in a new government. And this new government, what it did was it prevented a lot of profiting by insurance companies from the national health care system. One of those companies that was profiting was the Dutch Acmea, and they filed a suit against the Slovakian government. They won that suit and were awarded the right to appropriate 29.5 million euros from the Slovakian government, and which they took in terms of assets. Not satisfied with that, ACMIR now is about to launch another legal suit against the Slovakian government because the Slovakian government wants to introduce a national insurance scheme, a state insurance scheme, which makes it affordable for all Slovakians to have health care insurance. But the Dutch company doesn't like that because it's losing profits. It's waiting for TTIP to be signed, and it's actually going to file a massive lawsuit against the Slovak government. In other words, you can vote in any government you want, but the corporations are going to make you pay for it, and in the end, you have to reverse it. We see a number of other examples. The one that seems to have disturbed Angela Merkel is the last one, Germany against Vattenfall. This is a Swedish nuclear energy company that is now threatening to file a 3.9 billion euro lawsuit against Germany because Germany wants to abandon its nuclear power program. So of course the voters of Germany have made it very clear they don't want nuclear power. But this one corporation feels that it has the right to challenge the German government on this, and if the German government does not give in, they're going to seek massive damages. Okay? Again, this is showing you that once we allow this mechanism, and this is the core, this is the absolute plumb of TTIP, this mechanism where companies can sue governments when the governments do anything to damage their profit, basically they undermine the, the whole democratic process. And we know it's going to get much, much worse. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay? So once this happens, and I'm sorry to say I'm of the view that the corporations have invested far too much money to let it go, once it happens, then you're going to see a very different world, you know, a world in which no matter who you elect for whatever purposes, those governments are going to be held to ransom by these corporations. Sorry it took so long. Apologies.